Sugar Shane. Rick Johnson. Episode 31, man. <laughs> What's up, man? Episode 31 coming out right here, the Future Motocross Radio. Grateful to have everybody listening in to us, what we got going on right now. A lot of different things going to talk about, some exciting news, a uh, bunch of different things. And we got a special guest with us in the studio today, someone that I've known for a long time. I know, Shane, you haven't been in Dade City forever, so you might not know him as well as I do. But very grateful to have you here, Mr. Wilfredo Guzman. Hey, hey, what's going on? We Wilfredo Guzman, number six. Number six? Yep. And we're going to talk about some of the uh, the things that are going on with Wilfredo and how he got here. So we got we got a lot to talk about on this episode. Obviously, uh, there's, I mean, kind of some big things with the SMX and uh, the Armini Assassin, Carson Wood out there, you know, winning the, the Super Mini at, at uh, Chicago. So, you know, great for him. Congrats to, to him and Team Green Kawasaki, HBI Racing. So good, good deal there. And Want to get some of your opinion on the whole SMX thing and uh, the jet wave by? I want to get your opinion on that. <laughs> uh, we'll do a little bit of a little bit of a update on where we stand as far as the facility and the team goes. But I'd like to to get in on on learning this story because it's it's a pretty cool story with Mr. Wilfredo Guzman. I don't know if a lot of people kind of know you know the the history of Wilfredo, so I want to I want to start you know kind of peeling back that onion and, and kind of understanding Wilfredo and, you know, coming over to Dade City, Florida, you know, amateur racing, all the way up until what you're doing now and, and future, you know, what would what would the future hold for you? So I want to want to kind of go through all that stuff, if that's cool with you, Sugar. It's cool with me. You never asked me any of those questions, though. What? Where you're from? Yeah, like, like how I got to Dade City and what my future holds. And I think that was episode one. No. Maybe episode two. Okay, I'll throw you wine. Yeah, go, go back, back and, and play it back. It's sitting somewhere on Spotify or Apple Podcast or website somewhere. I, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I, we did. My bucket list is done, man. I'm on the podcast with you, so I'm I'm, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm I'm pretty sure we uh, we did that in episode one or two. Gave a little background on you and your story of of things, but I mean, if you want us to re rekindle that, we can. Yeah, I think I got more more in the tank. Okay, all right. Well, we'll go that route. But for right <laughs> now, we got we got Mr. Wilfredo Guzman. Will, I, I, I would say let's start from the very beginning, right? Where were you born? I was actually born in Puerto Rico. Born in Puerto Rico? Yes, sir. At what age did Wilfredo Guzman move to the United States? I moved, I think I was either six or seven years old okay. when I moved over here. So what were you doing in Puerto Rico at that time? Uh, so I was born, because he asked me where I was born. I was actually born in Puerto Rico. Yep. And then I moved to Dominican Republic Okay. at a young age. Okay. Um, that's where my dad is from. Okay. My mom is Puerto Rican. I was born in Puerto Rico, moved over to Santo Domingo, which is Dominican Republic. Gotcha. And then... Um, so family decision there. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. My dad actually rode back in the day. Really? Yeah. Okay. He wasn't very good. I yeah. think... Uh, Similar to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, we were at a race and I think it was Kenny Yoho that was racing over there. Really? Like racing like a... I guess they had like a big national... And they were bringing people from America over there. And Kenny Oho was racing. And my dad watched him ride. And he actually beat the number one guy over there in the Dominican Republic. Okay. So my dad goes up to Kenny. And he's like, hey, like, you're really good. You know, who taught you how to ride? And Randy happened to be there with him. And he goes, my dad did. And that's how it all started, you know. What a small world. <laughs> To be doing a race in the Dominican Republic, and Randy Yoho is there. Yep, so... Imagine that. My dad <laughs> met Randy that day, and he's like, so I see your son is very fast. He told me that you train him. I would like you to just take my kid and, and do the same thing. Yeah. And that's how it started. Wow. So, the, right. so did you get on an airplane with Randy, and he brought you home? No, <laughs> not that day. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. <laughs> take my kid, and, man. <laughs> yeah, no, it must have been... You know, may, maybe weeks or months. I'm, oh, I'm really? not sure. Yeah. But then I ended up coming to Florida. Um, on on I, your on your own or with your family? Um, I think with my grandparents. Okay. We got a house over here. We started riding at um, Bithlow, which now is Orlando. Okay. Right. Yeah. And I'm not sure. I don't think the diocese owned it then. No, it was somebody Wally, else. Wally did. Yes. Wally Wally owned it. Yeah. And I started riding on a on a KX60 which before I was just on a little 50, 
like KTM. I was going to say, so what was the first bike? It was a 50 KTM when I was riding, but it wasn't serious. You know, it was just kind of here and there. Yeah. And, um, Rainy didn't want me to ride those clutch bikes cause they, they're not, they're not any good. Yeah. You know? So we got on a KX 60, not a 65 at the time. Okay. They only had sixties. Yeah. And we didn't even ride the track. I remember we didn't ride the track and I was just crying like, cause I want to ride the track. And Randy's like, no, we're just going to put tires out here in the field and we're going to do circles. Oh, yeah. And um, he said I couldn't even make it two feet because it had, it had a clutch and shift. You know, you had to shift the bike. Couldn't make it two feet without just stalling the bike and falling over. Yeah. And that was it. That's where it all started. <laughs> so this is, this is somewhere around six, seven years old? Yeah. And, and started, you came over here with your grandparents, started working with Randy at that time. Yep. And then that continued for quite a while. Yeah, it did. Um, all the way up, I would say I was training with Randy probably around 13 years old, 14 years old. A lot of years. What would that, so that would have put you on what, maybe 85? Super, About an 85. Super, super mini? Yeah, 85 super mini area. Yeah. But at that time, it wasn't just you. Like there was other kids involved that Randy was helping out that you that you got to ride with. So yeah, Randy had you know he did Saturday morning schools at Dade City, and sometimes you'd have just like people come over at you know months at a time. But I was full time. I went to school in Orlando, and then like every Tuesday and Thursdays, I would drive all the way to Dade City. Right. When Randy had Tuesday nights, which he's I think he's doing that now. Yeah, sometimes. Um, but Tuesday nights, Randy would teach, and he'd have a handful of guys we'd ride. And then Thursday night, like, open practice to the public. So Randy must have, even at that young of an age, must have seen something in you to to want to, like, commit to that, you know? Um, I don't know if he saw something in me besides that I just loved well, riding my dirt bike. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. So. So what you, you said you went to school in Orlando. That's right, yeah. Like? Regular school or like? Yes, yeah, so regular school. Um, I was in, I want to say like St. Andrews, okay. which is a Christian school. Okay. I was in private school. Most of the time I was in school. And then right around like sixth or seventh grade, I went to a public school. And then eighth grade, I got homeschooled. Is, that, is that when it like started to become serious? Yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's pretty much around 13, 14 years old is when it gets serious for people. Yeah. I could see that. Did Randy ever involve any kind of like child labor for you? Like, did you have to work the snack? <laughs> did you have to work the snack bar or flag, you know, flag races or anything like that? At, you know, at a young age. I don't recall. Okay, good. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> he can't legally say. <laughs> I plead the fifth. I'm just trying to find out what's going on here with Randy. You know, like, but that's cool. That's cool to, to come from the Dominican Republic and get, to come over here and be able to ride your dirt bike. That's that's a good deal, R Randy. Randy's a good soul. Yeah, he definitely is. I don't even think I knew English at the time, like when I was, you know, when I first came over. But I just had to learn it, you know, yeah. learn the culture of America. Really? Yeah. That's cool, man. That's that's something different there. So let, talk about coming through that time. Like, obviously, you just got on 60, couldn't make it two feet. But then you got to be pretty quick. Yeah, I, um, I guess, like, I excelled pretty quick just because that's all I was doing. You know, I was going to school. And I'd ride my bike, yeah. you know, and at that age, just riding the motorcycle itself helps. But then I also had this coach, Randy Yoho, right. you know, and he's taught the great Carmichael, James Stewart, yeah. handful of those guys that were just unbelievable on a dirt bike. Yeah. So it kind of accelerated how good I was becoming. Probably gave you that. a little bit of confidence too, you know, being a young kid and knowing his history and this is the guy that's helping you out oh absolutely yeah and i mean i even to the day i mean i don't put all the credit on randy but i mean but look at rj hampshire i mean aiden shive you know these guys that have come through the dade city grind doing the local series and then they they develop into a national level whether it's even amateur national level or pro national level you know i mean you know, I, I'm not saying that's all on him. I mean, they had a lot of help, too. You know, I mean, right. RJ with his dad, Ricky, and Aiden with his uncle, Donnie. I mean, there was a lot of help there as well. But Randy having the facility, the training classes, like you mentioned, the Tuesday night, the Thursday night, the Saturday morning schools that he does every week. I mean, I take my son there, you know, personally, just because my son doesn't want to listen to me. You know, <laughs> he wants to listen to somebody else. 
That's with all dads. It, it's it's the same way I was with mine. Yeah. You know, but when did you start getting to the point where it was not just Dade City anymore and like we're going to go start doing some national level racing? So that was all on Randy's call. It wasn't my family. It wasn't me. It was all on Randy as to when we were going to kind of expand into the nationals and, and traveling. Right. You know? I think I, I was probably around nine, maybe, maybe eight, late, late eight. Um, I remember my first big national was Minio's. Okay. And I don't know how far into the week we were. I know on the motocross track, I think we were probably racing 65, 79. And right before the drop off, I fell and I ended up breaking my foot. I think I had a fracture in it. And I was so mad because um, I just knew I didn't want to disappoint Randy yeah. being at my first national. Sure. I don't know if it was the first motor or second motor or whatnot, but I knew there was more motos to go. Yeah. I remember being in the motor home and he's like, it's fine. Don't worry about it. It's okay. You know, if you're hurt, we'll just go home. And I didn't want to go home. You know, I, I thought I was disappointing him. So when he left, I got up off the couch and tried to walk on it. And I couldn't, you know? Yeah. So. Um, so that's, that's a Minios right there. I mean, you and I talked, which we'll get, we'll get into a little bit more of the, the depth of that, you know, kind of where we are now and going forward. But when you and I were talking the other day, I know you've done Loretta's a bunch. Yes. I mean, we're talking somewhere up around 15 times. I think if I go, oh. I'm going to try next year. I don't know what yeah. I'm going to do. We're, but We'll get into that. We'll get into that, but that could be your 15th time of going. Yes, yeah. So when was the first Loretta's? 65s, 85s? 65s. 65s? Yeah, 65s. Yeah. So probably that first Minios that you're talking about that you crashed and hurt, yeah. hurt your foot had to be somewhere in that time, team that, that, or time frame that Loretta's would have been next. Yeah, um, I, I remember my first Loretta's that I tried for, I didn't make it. Okay. You know, I just wasn't good enough. Yeah, well, I've never made it, so... <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the next next time I tried, I believe it was my second time, I ended up making it, and I went to Loretta's that year. Yeah, and that, you think that was 65s? Yeah, that, that was definitely 65s. So you start to see the, the national level and the improvements probably a little bit later in the 65 career, early 85 career. I mean, what was, what was some of the results up there? I mean, not necessarily Red, Loretta's, but national level events. I mean, Minios, Ponca. I know. think I was a top 10 kid. Okay. You know? Um Towards the end of the 65s, I was becoming more like a top five, you okay. know? Okay. And then you go into the 85s, continue to advance? 85s. Um, when I got on an 85, I was still riding 65s, which helped me out a lot. You know, bigger bike and then going back down to a 65 helped me throw the bike around. The 65 doesn't have as much power. Yeah. So I'd ride that faster and harder. Right. As far as the 85 went, I was just a short kid yeah. and I was afraid of the motorcycle. Yeah. So I wouldn't ride it to its full potential. Yeah. So you, you're basically telling us that the 85s were not great years. Yeah. Not the beginning, not the beginning of the 85, like the seven to 11 group. I just wasn't that good. Yeah. I was about to ask, like, is, did you not ride to its full potential the whole time you rode eighties or no, just, it just took a couple of years to, it just to get to that point. Years, and I think it's just cause I was a small kid. And so, the motorcycle was so fast. So you think later in the 85 years, I'm assuming kind of getting close to the super mini years is when you started to see a, a spike? Definitely. Right when I was probably 13, 14 yeah. is when I started to, to see another growth. So so almost 15 times of Loretta's. How many times did you ride 65s of Loretta's? <laughs> 31? No, no. <laughs> no, I'm just wondering, like, did you, did you ever get, you know, if you rode... 65 is quite a bit, you know, in the beginning going to Loretta's, like, how were your, how were your results? So the like, first, were they decent or? The first year I went, I believe in, in practice, I had a pretty good lap time. I might have had the fastest. Don't quote me on that. Sorry, man. It's a long time ago. I know it's yeah, hard to it's remember. Yeah, it's a very, very long time ago. <laughs> um, but as far as the motos went, I don't think anyone really has good luck there their first year. Oh, right. yeah. it's, it's always a struggle <laughs> there. I mean, look at this year. I mean, the yeah. complete rain you know, mutter. I mean, it, it's terrible results for some people, but, uh, 
out, I mean, going through those, what would be, in your opinion, from those mini bike years, your highest peak? My last year on the 65. And I think it's the 9 through 11 class. Okay. I don't know if it was stock or mod. I'm not sure. But my best moto finish was a fourth. And I ended up getting past the last lap by, I still remember, Nick Paluzzi. Really? He passed me on the last lap. Mm. Wow. I wanted podium so bad. I didn't, I didn't get it. But yeah, for a long time, we had a Paluzzi jersey in here. What did you do, throw it away? No, I didn't throw it away. Oh. <laughs> gave it to Greg. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. No, oh, we, had a, we had a Paluzzi, Paluzzi jersey in here for a long time in the, in the Legends room. But uh, there were some studs in that era. You know, the, yeah. t- the time that you were racing, I mean, that, there was a really fast core group of guys at that time. Yeah, I raced with the best of them. I raced with uh, Tomac, Ian Treadle, yep. Justin Barsha, yep. Ken Roxon, a lot of those guys. Yep. That, that, was a, that was a very fast era, I would say. Like when you look at, you know, some of the guys battling with. How, how old are you, Will Freda? I'm 31. Oh, okay. Never mind. <laughs> I was going to say because my, my son qualified for Loretta's and he had to, this was out in California, and he had to, he raced. 80s against Tomac. Okay. So it's kind of the time, but he's a little a little bit younger than you. But yeah. I remember Tomac lining up on a Suzuki. Well, some of those classes, I mean, you got like a three or four year yeah, age three, grab. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. because you could be. So there was potential that you could have raced against my son at the time, but he didn't. He qualified, but didn't go because kind of yeah. financially it was freaking hard to get from California to Tennessee. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a hike. That's a hike. So move on from mini bikes. So we yeah. talk about, you know, seeing a good spike or increase there around 13, 14. What happens at that point in, in the Wilfredo Guzman life? I think I was racing a Honda 85. Okay. And I was doing good. Um, like the local stuff, I'd be up front, you know. Yeah, like going, gold, gold Cup, Winter Yeah, Ram, Gold Cup, City. Winter Rams. Yeah. And then like as far as nationals, closer. I mean, I'm, I was always, I think, a top 10 guy. You know, sometimes be in the top five, wouldn't podium, you yeah. know, not, not in the podium yeah. positions, but. So that's 85. Yeah, that was 80. That's towards the end of the 85s. So when did you transition to 125? I didn't ride a 125. You went straight to 250? I didn't ride a 250F either. What? So <laughs> Would you ride a 450? Yeah, I went from a, <laughs> like a super mini per se, the super mini class to a 450 just because. When I, um, when I turned 16, my mom ended up not helping me out. She said if I didn't have a factory ride by the time I was 16, financially, she couldn't do it. Anymore. Yeah. So that's kind of when you stopped training with Randy? Well, I, I stopped before that, okay. around 14 years old. Okay. And that might be because of the financial mm-hmm. you know, situation. Yeah. As to why we stopped. But so tell, explain that transition then. So you, you, were, with, <laughs> you were with Randy... And that would have been through Super Minis? About 13, 14. Okay. So yeah. coming into Super Minis. Yeah, coming into Super Minis, yeah. You stopped training with Randy. Where Where is Wilfredo at that point? Just trying to get by. Just trying to go to different races. Um, what, by yourself? No. So I had a I had a buddy. His name's Steven Strange. Okay. He kind of took me under his wing. Okay. And he was the one that was taking me to races, signing me up. Obviously, I think he was like older than 18 to be able to do that for yeah. me. Yeah, so he had to um, kind of act like the legal guardian. Yeah, he was like my legal guardian, and he would take me to the, some of the nationals, yeah. um, qualifiers for Loretta's. So not a ton of training at that time, just more of just no, riding. Just yeah, riding. yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah, so where were you riding at, and, I mean, who were you around? Um, I don't remember who I was around, but we'd ride, like, private tracks. Okay. Sometimes go to Kroon, yep. you know. Yeah. Um, maybe just find, like, a – property that didn't have anything that we could go out and ride sure still a date city Randy did help me out there because he's the owner of that yeah you know yeah um but yeah so i'm just trying to i'm trying to figure out that transition because i think that's for me what year would that have been if you were if you were 16 years old what year was that are we talking like 2010 2000 2009 2008 2008 2009 I think that's kind of right when when I was getting out of it. I mean, TC, we had the iMoto stuff at that time, and I think it was right around that 2008, 2009 that we kind of were peaking with the iMoto stuff, and then I ended up selling it. Uh, Well, I worked with Randy at 2009, 
I thought you worked there. I did. You weren't 16. Here comes the child labor. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. Was I 17 then? I don't... I mean, maybe it was. I don't know. What'd you do? What'd you do for work? I just hung out. <laughs> I acted like I All was right. working. I didn't know much. That was my first job. Okay, working so work, working for Andy. So I'm I'm just trying to map all that out at that time because I think that's I think that's kind of when when I that's when I first met my wife. Um, we just started dating in 2008. I was full steam ahead in the iMoto world. Tyler and I were trying to take over uh, at that time, and then I started stepping out of it. That's not right. When did you live with the Keelons? Right when I turned 18. Well, we, with the we, haven't, we haven't gotten there yet. We're only at 16 right now. I thought you lived with the Kelons when you worked at Randy's. Yeah, you're right. Sorry. 17 to 18 then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so mean, when he was 16, he that, was homeless. That, so I, I wasn't I'm, homeless. I was living with my buddy Stephen Strange that I... That's what I was getting to. Is like we're we're up to the point now where you're we're talking about the the life of Wilfredo Guzman, and we're up to 16 years old. That transition is kind of when I started getting out of of our little local industry. You know, we sold Imoto to a, another guy, um, and I just kind of stepped out of the game for a little while. You know, at that time with Imoto, I mean, we had. I mean, we did were you when you were doing the Imoto though, and obviously you're going to these tracks. Did you know about Wilfredo? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, definitely. I knew about Wilfredo since, you know, he kind of came over. I'm trying to put I this mean, puzzle together right now. Yeah, well, we've always known Randy, and we've always been at Dade City all the time. And then when I did the iMoto thing, you know, we started doing a lot of stuff with Red Bull and did a lot of filming over with James. And iMoto kind of was building into, like, a publishing, you know, company, essentially. I mean, like a, a small-town Racer X, if you would say. Right. We had the online side. We were putting articles up. We were doing photos. We were doing video. And I knew it Wilfredo at that time, but at then Sponsor Cup was a big thing, and we were traveling to Winter Rams and Gold Cups and Loretta's doing the iMoto side. We were even going to Pro Nationals with Tyler Livesay, and uh, we had Mike Pacone, was, you know, at that time was on one of our bikes on a Suzuki uh, that we got through Barney's with Casey Wood, and you know, we were having a lot of fun, and, and everything was going great, and then I ended up selling it uh, to another guy that, that wanted to take it over and continue and um that's kind of when i fell out but i feel like i feel like for me that's when you were peaking yes like right that's right at the 16 yeah age mark and i kind of got out of it right as you were peaking and then didn't really didn't really follow it for a little while i mean obviously life you know life happens yep. you know obviously uh got a you know got married and tried to settle down and really put my head down at work and you know, try and make, make moves and, and stuff at work. And that, that's kind of the, the time that I stepped away from it, which I think is when you probably would have been at your prime. Yeah. So I'll talk a little bit about how I got on the 450. Yeah. I was going to say, let's rewind. Cause I want to know what a transition from 85 <laughs> to a 450 is like, cause I've never heard that transition before. Yeah. And, and you did explain that you, your mom was kind of like, yo dude, like get your, get your act together, you know, or I'm not going to support you or you're not act together, but you know what I mean? financially support you unless right. you got a factory ride. So d is that what pushed you to get on a 450? Like I get factory 450 right now or like <laughs> 85 to a 450 is, you know, it's a little, it's a big jump. So being a, a smaller statue of a, yeah. of a male, um, I was able to ride 85s and super minis all the way to the end of, yeah. of the age group. Right. Just how your age or right. your birthday kind of panned out. Yeah. So I was riding, um, my last year, I was riding super minis. I was riding 154 strokes. And I was going to do mini O's. It was going to be my last. I was going to ask you if you rode a 150. I did. Okay. I think I rode the first generation. Yeah. Yeah. I had no problems with them. I thought they were great. Yeah. Four stroke torque. But the high end, it wasn't there. The 112 would have, you know, it'd be faster right. at the high end. But in the very beginning on the takeoff, they were mean. They were yeah. really good. Um, so my last year was going to be probably 2008, probably 2009, somewhere around there. And Randy had a Stars of Tomorrow race, yes. but it was only 85 cc's. And at the time, I was racing 150s, so I, I couldn't ride my 150. And I was friends with the Langs, 
and they've been riding at Dade City for years and years. Oh, yeah, good people. And he said, well, I have an 85cc that my oldest son doesn't ride. It's been in the garage a couple years. Mm. I said, well, I'll ride it if it runs. He goes, I'll see if it starts up, and if it does, you can race it. Ended up starting up, and then the Stars of Tomorrow race came. People didn't like that I was racing that race just because of how old I was, but I was still eligible, sure. you know, as far as age. Yep. I raced and ended up winning the race, and I think they were giving away a pit bike yep. at that race. I think Whoever, I remember that race. I yeah. think I went to that. I, when, I moto. We, we're, we were there, weren't we? Didn't we do something with that event? I think, was that the first year of this Stars of Tomorrow? Because I think he's done it, it been. three or four times. Yeah, it might, it might have been the first year of like the 85s. I know before they did um, like a 125 two stroke, I believe. Like Dean Dias was winning it and he went to go do a wheelie and he fell and he lost the race. And that was in the last lap. Mm. That was at Day City. So you, so you won the pit bike? Yes. So you went from 85s back down to 50s. <laughs> 110. Or one. <laughs> oh, I'm just trying to get the transitions here, man. No, so I'll, I'll take you kind of like through the motives yeah, yeah, yeah. of that Stars of Mara race. I was actually racing against RJ. And oh. RJ, the first moto, he was winning. I got a bad start. I climbed up to second. And on the last lap, last turn, I think he washed the front. And I ended up passing RJ for, no for the way. win in that moto. You lie. Nope. <laughs> They weren't happy either. <laughs> RJ's family was not happy with me because how old I was. Mm. Um, then the second moto, I knew how the points was going to be as far as the overall. Yeah. And whoever was winning, I, it might have been CK Douglas won that moto. And I was behind him, and I knew that I, I didn't have to beat him for the overall. Right. And they were giving the pit bike away for the overall. So I won that. They gave me the pit bike. And for me to make it to mini O's that year, remember I said my mom wasn't helping me out anymore. I didn't ride the pit bike. I sold it back to the dealership. That way I could get money right. to fix my bike for mini O's. Yeah. And then I went to mini O's with that money. It's a great story. So, and you're what? I like it. 15? 16. 16. 15. So, so you're, you're essentially funding yourself to go to mini O's at 16 years old. That's right. That's pretty impressive. Some probably some life lessons, honestly, learned in that. You just, know, just off of that win, financial management and you know logistics and strategy. Yeah, so, and at that age, you're like, oh, I got a pit bike, man, I like it. And look, like, you know, you sold it just to make it to the next race. Yeah, I never even started it, never got on it. And at that age, I mean, pit bikes are. Yeah, they were huge. Yeah, they're they're cool. Yeah, for, we had pit bike you know, races 16, all over the place. 16, 15, 14 year old, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Hell, I still like. That's pit very. Bikes. Man, what are you trying to? Say? Very responsible of you at that age. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. That's a that's a big move, man. That's where life lessons come from. Yeah. I mean, that that's a whole nother topic we'll get into later. But okay, so we don't, go through sixteen, I, right? So, so yeah. you go to that minios. And um if we back up for a second, that's yeah. not the only thing that I won that night. So sponsor cup was really big and there was a new sponsor coming in. His name was Mark Dory. He was actually in talks with Randy about sponsoring Flex a pack. guy. That's correct. Flex pack. Yeah. yeah. Wasn't he foreign? He was from England. Yes. Yes. Really nice guy. I remember But he this. was in talks with Randy on sponsoring someone for the Sponsor Cup class. What, the what was the guy's club, name? Mark. Mark Dory. Randy always becomes guys from England with the name Mark's friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Mark Dory. So the Sponsor Cup was a 450, not only, but that's what they race is 450 bikes. Yep. And Randy said, well... Here's the winner of the Stars of Mara. He's old enough to ride a 450. And that's how I got on 450s. Wow. So I skipped the 125s, the 250s, solely because I didn't, financially, I couldn't do it. You know, I was 16. And he got me a 450, and I, I started racing Sponsor Cup. How was that the first time you threw your leg over that thing? Big eye opener. Yeah. That thing was so fast. I was wheeling over, over like, everything. You know, as soon as I hit the gas coming out of that turn, and the thing just wanted to rip off my hands. No, I mean, not to mention that he's 100 pounds. Yeah. You know. I still weigh that now. That's what I'm and saying. I'm 31. I, mean, I, I was, right now, what did we talk about the other day when we were getting gear? You're like 120? Yep. So yep. imagine Wilfredo at 16. Fun fact. 
my <laughs> last my last year on 65s i bought the thor yellow gear at loretta's when i was 12 years old it still fits me to this day really Yes. Probably fits good. I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice and snug, but it fits, you know? It fits. Yeah, yeah. I could I could ride in it. So you end up you end up going through that minios and then you transition over to, to racing some of the sponsor cup series, which at that time was really going off. I mean, Randy had a big thing going at Dade City. We actually talked about that on the last episode with Ian Millett that we had on here. I mean, there was we didn't even realize what we had going on at that time, but we already kinda hit on that on the last episode. So you start jumping on that 450 at Sponsor Cup. Were you still doing national level races on the 450? Like Loretta's, Minio's? I don't remember if I did any. I mean, of course I was racing. I did, I did Sponsor Cup. Um, no, actually we, we did. I think I'd be in the 450B. I can't race the C-Class because I already made it to Loretta's beforehand. Right. You know? Um, I did like the Winter Ams local stuff again, Winter Ams, Gold Cups. Um, I qualified for Loretta's my first year on the 450, 450B. Yeah. And my sponsor actually bought a brand new bike going into Loretta's. I just, I did the, the break in on it. I rode practice at Loretta's and the first moto, it blew up. The mm -hmm. second moto, I believe like go, I went to the line. And I forgot that there was intermission before my race. So I'm like, okay, like, I'm not just going to sit here in the heat. I'm going to go back, you know, get under some shade. I went to go kickstart it. We had kickstarters then. Yep. It wasn't push to start like <laughs> what these bikes have now. Yep. And it was locked up. So we pushed it on over to the manufacturer I bought it from. They fixed it. I went out. It blew up again. Ugh. So they ended up giving me a loaner motor for my third moto. I think I got to like a third place start. Somebody passed me. I was in fourth place. A couple laps to go and it blows up again. Man. A brand new motorcycle. Yeah. What year was this? Oh, nine. That's kind of right when everything was starting to switch over to EFI. Yeah. That was mm -hmm. instead 2009. Of instead of carbureted. I'm trying to guess the make. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> well, I mean a lot of all almost every make was transitioning at that time that's why timmy and i were you know we were talking about we had that destinations bike sitting right here before timmy got a shop built and he he took it to his new house but you know that destination bike the only reason they let him keep it is because they were switching from carbureted to efi hmm. instead of crushing it and getting rid of that bike yeah but either way so i'm trying to think in my mind you know we talked somewhere between 13 and 15 times of going to the reddas a lot of that's probably mini bike years right so yes. 65 85 super mini and then yeah. you did go back on the 450 at least once or twice i did i i did 450b and that's what i just talked about yeah and then i went into i wanted to my plan was to ride b class two years one class a one year a yeah and then go pro where most factory guys, they would do one year B, two years of A class, and then they'd move pro. At that time, yeah. At that time, yeah. It's yes. different now. That's how they did it. Where I was gonna do, you know, because I just didn't have as much help. Right. Two years B, one year A, and then go pro. So the following year, when I went to go sign up for a B class race in the 450s, they said I pointed out because really? I did a lot of racing doing the Gold Cups. Yep. And I just, I ended up getting so many points where they had to move me up the next year. So hmm. did you go to, did you go in A? Yes. So I, I did go in 450A. I, so I was 18 at the time. And then this is when I ended up moving to the Keelons, okay. Keelons house. Yep. Right off of Remington Road. Oh yeah. And um, I remember Corey asking me if I wanted to go to prom with him, you know, like, not together. <laughs> I was going to say, you might want to clarify that. That, that, that came out weird, dude. Sorry. <laughs> Will you go to prom with me? I mean, Co every time I see Corey, he's always, he's, he does stand pretty close to me. It's kind of weird. But. <laughs> no, he had a girlfriend at the time. Yeah. And his girlfriend's cousin didn't have anybody to go with. And he asked me if I wanted to go. I thought it'd be a good time. I've never been to prom. I was like, yeah, let's, let's do it. And he's like, grab all your stuff. Cause you're just gonna live on my house after. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, just get everything and then. You weren't scared. No, I mean, I've <laughs> I've known the Keelons know, ever I since. Know. I <laughs> yeah. I moved over here, yeah. right? Yeah. 
you know, right when I turned seven, yeah, when I came to America. One of the most solid families there is in Moda. Very, very solid. Yeah. So I grabbed all my stuff and I moved over there and I'm like, dude, did you ask your parents? He's like, yeah, they'll be, they'll be fine with it. <laughs> <laughs> and they were, they were all into racing then, you know, Kyle, yeah. I think was pro. Yep. Corey was in the amateurs, just killing it. Yeah. That kid goes so fast. Yeah, he does. And um, that whole summer we trained together right up top, yep. the facility that was up there that Randy owned. Yep. And I qualified for Loretta's in the 450A class. And my goal was to make it underneath the tent at least once, you know, one moto. That yep. was my goal. So to be under the tent would be top 10. Yes. My first moto, I got 15th. Second moto, I got 12th. And the third moto, I believe I was in seventh or ninth. I think it was seventh place. One or two laps to go, my bike blows up. Of course. All the oil just leaks out of it, and it blows up. Reoccurring theme Jeez. here from you, bud. I was so devastated. You must be riding that thing hard, that 450. Yeah, I think we got to get a new mechanic <laughs> or something, man. <laughs> Woo. Yeah, so you go so you go in to Loretta's on 450B, you do Loretta's 450A. Yep. At this point you're 18. What happens after that? I mean, you continue racing, you still sponsor cup in it, you still Yeah, I continue racing so after Loretta's um Minio's like the next big national. Yep. I I go there in the A class. I I do well somewhere in the top 10, you know. And then going into I believe was my second year of sponsor cup. You know, I was supposed to do better, and I ended up do. You know, I ended up getting getting better results in the sponsor cup class. I mean, we had divisions, oh, yeah. LCQs. Yeah, it was so big. I believe it was 2010. Yeah, 2010. It's kind of right, right when it was at its peak, right? TC's like 09, 10 is when we were we had the TV package and the Bright House deal and. Yeah, 09, 10, 11. Yeah. So I ended up, you know, getting better results gradually towards the end of the year and the last race i remember i haven't even been on the podium and i went one one the last sponsor cup race and that was huge for my confidence yep. because i was racing against mike pacone oh yeah ian millet kyle keelan yeah livacy yeah i mean those guys were established riders you yeah. know on a, on a motorcycle yeah <laughs> there was a lot we, we talked about that in the last episode when you go back and throw all the names and the different people that were there for locally in Florida that was huge you know what what was happening that time but so you go through that season yeah, I mean continue on with the 450 rides and at what at what point did you stop riding where you were like okay I'm just I can't do this anymore what what decision was at that point I think it was you know, just becoming an adult, getting older, yeah. and I had to go to work, you know, and that was a big, big push from, like, the Keelons, right. you know, um, which they were a huge help to me. Sure. They helped me a lot. And that was probably 2011 is when that transition happened where, hey, you're an adult. You got to go to work. Right. You know, you got to make some money. Yeah, I that mean, it's go racing. M most of those, you know, people at that time, I mean, Shane, you got two kids and I'm, I, I have three, but, you know, 18 years old, it's like, you know, okay, let's, you know, if you don't have, like your mom told you initially at 16, but really at 18, you know, if you don't have a ride lined up, if you're not, you know, getting everything kind of covered and handled and taken care of for you, at some, at some point, I'm sure you have to look in a mirror and say, what am I doing? Right. You well, know, did the, without a doubt. Did that screw with you a little bit? Or maybe it didn't, like at, at that age and, and you were racing and, and kind of start, you said you were starting to get good results. Did you still think or have that dream to become pro at that point when they told you, hey, man, you might want to get a job? Yeah, so I was good all the way until I got hurt. Oh, gotcha. And then once I got hurt, I just wasn't able to ride as much just because I was, I was working. Right. I was working more than I was riding. Right. And that was really like my biggest bone that I broke at that time was my femur, Yeah. which was at Daytona Amateur Supercross. That's a big one. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was so, big. So Daytona Amateur Supercross, and that was what, when you're 18 or 19? I think I was 19, okay. 2011. Okay. I remember it vividly because yeah. 
that's a hard bone to break. Yeah. You don't forget. Right. Unless you got knocked out, which I didn't. Mm. Um, so, you're they, ni- you're, so you're 19 years old, laying in a hospital bed in Daytona. Yes. And, yep. it's, and at some point right then, you probably were thinking, man, this hurts. Not as bad as like when they put me on the back stretcher and I was like, get me off this thing. Yeah. That, that hurt worse, I think. Huh. <laughs> So, so what's that thought then? So you're, you're sitting in the hospital at 19, you got the key lines kind of telling you, Hey man, you know, it's time to grow up. Uh, yeah. You know, you're an adult now, you need to start figuring out life. And then what you, you say, Hey, I'm going to go start applying somewhere and, and say, you know, it's time to put my big boy pants on. I mean, do you keep riding? I mean, are you still doing sponsor cup after that? Or are you just kind of like starting to starting to phase out of it at that time? Yeah. I, I stayed riding, you know, I didn't want to believe that the dream just kind of went away from me you know yeah yeah but i got a job with randy randy gave me opportunity to work for him my first job yeah i ended up sleeping one (laughs) one day on the shift uh i had my head down and he comes in and he he slams his fist kind of like on the desk and i jump up real fast and i say amen I was just praying, man. I, was just I said, praying. Randy, I was just praying. You're not, you're not allowed. To, you're not allowed to pray here, or what? Oh uh, yeah. Why are you interrupting my prayer, man? <laughs> Come on, man. I was actually taking a nap. Disrespectful. Nice. <laughs> so at that point, I mean, you just kind of like, okay, I'll, I'll just ride when I can for fun, or is it like, I'm no, just, I mean, I'm I, done. I'm I done. still chased it, you know, but it just got harder. Oh yeah. 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 I mean, work, work hours take away from riding and training time. And then obviously you have to have the finances to be able to continue to do it. Cause at this point you're basically doing it on your own. Yeah. I think it took me a couple years to get over my, my femur just cause like I said, I, I didn't ride as much when I, when I worked yeah. and I think if I would have just stayed riding, then that kind of would have been pushed further back in my mind and not think about it when I, when I rode. But since I didn't have that time, it was just, it was just there thinking about my femur. Yeah. How bad it hurt. Yeah. And not wanting to do that again. Yeah. 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 Like took me a couple of years. No, that's, I mean, that's one of those things. That's fear, you know, fear gets in there, man. It's hard to get it out. Yeah. So you kind of get your first job with Randy kind of phasing out of the motorcycle a little bit. Where does life take you on that path? I started teaching kids how to ride their bikes. Okay. And, um, I actually, I love that a lot. Kenny Yoho brought me under his wing. Yep. And um, I was helping him with, with schools that he was doing. I got a lot of enjoyment. You know, I was able to still kind of stay riding and teaching kids how to ride. Yeah. Which which helped. Yeah. I think that's that's pretty common. I mean, a lot of, a lot of guys or people that are passionate about the sport, you know, I, I say it all the time, and I know, Shane, you agree with me all the time, is as soon as you try to get out of this sport and get out of this industry, there is something that will bring you back in, some type of passion. I mean, every time we There's talk no about no getting out of racing. I don't care what form of racing, though. If you're into yeah. racing, you're always going to be part of it. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's it's funny, too, because, you know, we just had Ian Millett on, on the last episode, episode 30, and, you know, he got out of it for a while, but now he's riding again, you know, and you got out of it for a while, which we're going to talk about kind of where you are now, <laughs> but there's always something that brings you back in. And even like I was saying at that time, you know, we had the Imoto stuff going and stepped out of it for a couple of years, you know, built, you know, got married and started building a life with, with my wife, Anna, and, you know, for some reason we decide let's get back into this and you know start helping kids out and let's build a team and start a podcast you started hanging out with me yeah and then like oh you did what and you did moto this moto that and it just starts happening the itch is right back there again you know so that's that's fun to see but so let's go at that point you kind of get out of it right helping some kids you get out of it what is what is the next step for you I, so when I started teaching, I was just doing um, just random classes, and then I ended up picking up, helping out these kids, Moon Garretts yep. and Maggie Garretts. Yep, good people. And I was full on with them, full on trainer with them, and we did that for probably five, six years. Really? Yes. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Kind of just how like Randy took me in and taught me. Yep. I was able to do that with these with these kids. Sure which was a brother and sister. Yeah. And I got them when they were on fifties. Oh yeah. Great, know? great family. Really good. Yeah. Helped me out. 
And um, so we trained, and I was able to take them to Loretta's. So to their first time at Loretta's. What was your – when you said that you were, you were having to – you were working and working hours and stuff like that, I mean, obviously you're not with Randy at that time. You know, you had, you had left Randy. When, when did – what was work? So I know you were training with them, and then you got a real job too? Yeah. I ended up getting a job with UPS. Oh, see, that's great. <laughs> that's a great and, job. Um, the way that I was able to train in the afternoons with the kids was that my job started at four in the morning, which was loading the trucks up before yep. they left to go out on their routes. Yep. And it was only a part-time job, which was from four to about nine, nine thirty in the morning. Yeah. So Shane, I want to think about this. I, I had a conversation the other day with one of my office managers, uh, Stephanie and, and you know, her son and that age group, group of friends, you know, they're just graduating high school and, the big thing for them right now is, you know, everybody's got to have this, you know, badass truck, right? So her son is, is talking to her about his buddies and everybody going out and buying these, you know, really nice trucks. I mean, like super duties, you know. Newer, like, like newer trucks? Yeah, like $60,000 $60, trucks. Oh, wow. And she and I were talking and, and I'm just sitting there and, uh, you know, one of the one of the kids and the buddies, that, you know, they mentioned like, what's the interest rate? Like I asked and they're like, what, what do you mean? What is that? <laughs> and I'm like, you don't know what an interest rate is? Do you know what principal is? And they're like, <laughs> I don't know. And I'm sitting here in my mind, and I'm listening to Wilfredo as he's talking, funding himself going racing, selling a dirt bike that he won in an event, selling it to, to fund his race to the next race, and then go to work at four in the morning with a very stable company like UPS, you know, which is a great company, UPS, Publix, you know, any of those that you can kind of get your foot in the door at a young age and work your way through there. I mean, I had a, a great friend of mine that is now in accounting at Publix and that he actually just moved from their headquarters uh, down kind of like Lakeland area and just moved to Jacksonville to their accounting center. But I mean, he's doing really well. I mean, doing really well, but he started there sweeping the floors. Yeah. You know, right when he was in high school. So I'm sitting here listening to Wilfredo. I'm thinking about that conversation in my mind the other day about these kids in high school that are wanting to go out and buy a brand new truck or a newer truck, you know, sixty, sixty five thousand dollars, don't even know what interest rates are. And here you got Wilfredo selling dirt bikes to yeah. fund his next race and then gets his foot in the door, even if it is part time, but going to work at four in the morning with a great company like UPS. I mean, kudos to you, man. Thank you. Kudos to you. I mean, I'm, I'm proud of you because when you think about, you know, basically like you started off this whole conversation with, let's reflect on this, take my kid and go make him a motocross rider. But at the same time, learning real life decisions and life goals and going through those motions and, and effectively doing them, that's impressive. That's impressive. Thank you. So cool to see. I don't want to word this wrong, but it just seems like people that come to this country from another country just want it more yeah you know to be successful and work hard you know and, and it, it it makes sense you know well, and, and i'm not necessarily i you know I, I agree with your statement yes but i'm not saying that it has to be somebody that comes from another country i think that there's just something in people naturally like even aiden he's got a lot of dog in him you know he's got a lot of dog he's got yeah. a lot of fight in him he's yeah. very very tough kid uh, and I think that's, you know, just because of how he was raised. Yeah. And, and I think in this situation, I mean, you had a lot of help from some great people. I mean, yeah. I, I would assume, and I'm not speaking for you, you could tell me if I'm wrong, but I would assume at some points that probably Randy was a little bit of a father figure. Yeah, he was. And, yeah, and, I had a couple of different people that helped me out. Yeah, and possi out. possibly even Kenny Keelan, you know, which, I mean, those, those two names alone in the sport of motocross and even in life are great people. And, and that's, that's cool, you know, to hear that story. So I'm just saying I, what I meant by that is, is just in, I'm not saying across the board, but in racing, it seems like the kids that are like more, you know, I mean, it wasn't easy coming over here by yourself at seven years old. And, you know, and, and if you look at the history of the racers in this industry, you know, it's the ones that had to struggle when they came up. And those are nine times out of 10, I think are the most successful ones. Yeah, well, and I think that's kind and of... And they have a work ethic, you know, and, and, now, and now Wilfredo's over there working his butt off at UPS and training kids and, yeah. you know, it got it's survival, man, you yeah. know? I will say, like, no matter if you come from a wealthy family or you don't, right? everybody struggles. 100%. You know? 
it's just their perspective of what struggle is. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's a that's a great great point and a great way to put it and and I agree with you too Shane I mean you you look at some of the stories I'm just saying you like, even look at the Lawrences right now you know you hear about the struggles that they had and what they were doing to get by with racing I well, this is my opinion but with racing it's not an argument like it's it's the ones that are just handed everything that it doesn't normally work out yeah yeah you know what I mean yeah, yeah I understand and that might be from the way they kind of grew up, right? Yeah. Like they want something and whoever it is that's handing it to them, yeah. that that might be it. Right. Yeah. Instead well, of the, working for it. Are you still with UPS? I am, yeah. Nice. I'm currently still with UPS. Um, so how, hit, how long has that been? I hit 10 years in February this year. Really? Yes, sir. See, that that's a, such a great example of getting in with a solid company that's that's been around that you know you're going to have a stable paycheck come from that you guys you know you can li- you can really build with that for a long time yeah so now i'm a full-time driver you know i go out on route i deliver boxes nice. but it took me six years to get into a driving position where i, I was full-time really so six whole years is that normal at ups it just depends like what but, warehouse you get into yeah you know, um, at what time you get in. But as far as like the location where I'm at, it just took that long. And I know guys that waited nine, 10, 11 years really? before they stepped into a full-time driving position. Hmm. So let's just kind of recap here. You know, you're talking about we're, we're phasing out of riding, we're training the, with the Garrett's, we, we've got a part-time deal going four in the morning at UPS, getting our foot in the door with an established company. That's a great, great move. Let's fast forward now. You said you've been there for 10 years. That's right. So that's that's impressive. You know, good job for, for sticking with them through the whole thing. So what is a day-to-day life of Wilfredo now? Is it basically focusing on work at UPS and getting those routes done? And then ha- have you ridden lately? I mean, when was the last time you raced a dirt bike? About five years ago. Really? When um, Dade City had an area qualifier. Okay. I raced the plus 25 class. I believe I was 26 at the time. Okay. And I was like, oh, you know, I'll do the area and then I'll go to the regional and I'll yeah. qualify and go Loretta. I mean, is it just, just for fun at this point or? Yeah, just for fun. Yeah. Just to ride. Okay. And so I ended up doing the area. I think I got like second or third overall. And then just life just happened, you know, just work. I wasn't able to get off to yeah. do the regional. Yeah. So I missed out. And then I sold my bikes that I had at the time and I bought a house with my girlfriend. There you go. My first house. Nice. Yeah. So I used that money to put you know, the 10% or whatever it is down, right. Yeah. you know, and she gave me some funds too. And we bought a house together and moved in. There you go. So that, that goes to, uh, not racing for a little while there, but, but here's your breaking news. Or did he always say the but? <laughs> I did. I did hear that the Wilfredo Guzman threw a leg over a bike the other day. I did. Uh, oh. we had a, con- we had a conversation that uh, I wanted to get back into riding. And you said you had some bikes. You didn't want to sell or anything. And you asked how long to ride, and I said, "Sure, why not? I'll buy one." So, like he 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 just alluded to having a conversation with him again. I think we're going to be nice or something. Yeah, it's been a long time. It's been a long time. Yeah. Obviously, our age difference. I was never extremely close because I was older than you are. Uh, and then, like you said, kind of the cool peak is kind of when I stepped out of, of the other side. Of the you know, just like the conversation we had the other day or on the last episode, was, you know, you, you, you always find a way to come back into it. And here it is, a similar situation for you. Is, you know, five years goes by of not, not riding or racing a dirt bike at all. And we're just having a conversation, you know, two friends sitting around talking. Man, I'd like to ride again. Well... I just so happened to have some bikes, you know, we just got done doing outdoors and uh, got, got a couple 450s around, so let's go ride one. So I actually saw a snippet of the video. I was watching a little yeah, bit. And yeah. Hey, so it doesn't he, seem like you lost that much, man. It was rough. I don't know. It looked pretty <laughs> damn good to me. <laughs> he did like four laps. And he's like, my arms. Yeah, my well, arms. Well, that part of it. But I mean, you had some style. Like, you were getting after it. You know? Oh, yeah. No, it, it, we had a couple people out there with us. We were at the facility. The guys with 402 are redoing the super cross track right now. This one is the Alfredo. Again, great, great thanks to the people that we have in our corner with Fox. And we were able to get some product for them. 
happen to be able to throw a leg over the back and we're gonna little, we're gonna make a little run here on this. Uh, now we're going instead of twenty five plus, we're gonna go thirty plus. That's right. But I I definitely second guess myself after I rode after being <laughs> off for five years and next it's, morning it's hard. Yeah, I was paying for it. Yeah, yeah. it's always gonna be it's, like that. It, though, the it, first it takes time. time. <laughs> first time back is gonna be sore for at least a few days. Yeah. But the more you do it, the better off it's going to go. But yeah, it, it was it was fun. Like you said, when you saw that video clip, I mean, I, yeah. I'm the one that shot that video, watching on the edge of the track, and it it uh, it's cool to see it. You know, it was that was Aiden's practice bike from from outdoors, so we just went ahead and freshened it up, put some you know new tires, sprockets, chains, everything, grips on there, and let him go rip it to get a feel for it. And he's like, man, this thing is fast. I feel like it's like the first time I stepped onto a 450 when yeah. I was 16. Same thing, you know, yeah. crack the throttle, front wheels all up in yeah, the air, yeah. wants to get away from you. The track looking pretty good, too. Oh, it looks great. Man. And I was thinking about Brad yesterday because he turned me on to this Brad from 402, and his guys obviously do stellar work. But yep. I turned on Ghost, the band Ghost, in my shop. You know, I was doing some work on a Suzuki 110. Yep. And I was just thinking about him. About the band Ghost. Oh, yeah, Brad came up, got to, got to give Brad a hug. He's gonna, if he listens to the podcast, he's going to like it. Yeah, I know he came up and uh, his dude Corey man did phenomenal job and and uh, obviously one of our partners in the facility out there Kyle Cheeseman's you know knows how to work a dozer and it's it's yeah. impressive what those two guys did in yeah. three and a half days. A lot, I mean, there's a lot of dirt to move. A lot of dirt to move to go from an overgrown, unrideable supercross track to basically rip all the dirt over and turn it all and, and rebuild a brand new layout. Uh, we took the irrigation out because we have a, you know, we got Coop's water truck. So, uh, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, anybody that follows us on Instagram or sees, sees some of the, the teasers and the pics that we put on there, uh, they did a phenomenal job and that, you know, that 402 Corey and even Kyle, I mean, those guys did a phenomenal job. So really cool to see that, uh, shake out the outdoor tracks done now that the supercross track is done because there's a part of the outdoor track that has to go around the supercross track so they added some obstacles and got the outdoor track completely done so it it's really cool to see but it's it's exciting to have Wilfredo who obviously I've known for a long time has a lot of a lot of ties right here locally to our team and the people that are involved you know like he mentioned the Keelan family you know Corey's a huge help to me Corey's been helping us at the facility my son Benji and Corey's son Rowdy uh, are great friends and you know do sleepovers all the time so there's just a, a tie it almost feels like you know Wilfredo's been part of the family for a while so did it, you did you ever race a or ride a supercross right uh I rode supercross like right before mini o's but yeah. I skipped the whoops Oh, okay. Whoops on her thing for me because yeah. that's how I broke my femur at the Daytona Amateur Supercross. Yeah. Uh, Not very good. I just, you know, with, with your racing and, you know, maybe that – now all the kids ride Supercross. You know what I mean? I didn't know if that era that you're you're coming up with age, if, especially on a 450, if you ever got on a Supercross track. Yeah, I did. Just briefly, like I said, before many O's. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you ride the, the new one – Go ahead and skip the whoops again. <laughs> we don't have I don't supercross know if suspension. I want to ride a supercross track now because right. I'm older. But yeah, I have I have a bet for RJ right now. He doesn't know about it, but um, oh yay! I was gonna, willing to put some money down if I can just get you to do one rhythm section clean. There's on, no on a dirt bike. No, I'll come, say, I'll, come I'll on, I on that bet too. Yeah, come come on, no man. No way. No, no way. I would, yard, wager. I would yard sale myself straight into the next one. I'm not even give you a time frame. Just do one jump at a time and just get it oh, figured I could, out. I could do one roller at a time. I could roll the whole rhythm section, <laughs> no, we, no problem. We need to get some air. No, I'm a wheels on the ground. So looking at that that's track. Part of, that's part of my contract. Looking at that track doesn't tempt you a little bit just to like do a double. Oh, I would love to. I would, I would love to. As soon as, as soon as I saw it when it was done, I was like, man, it'd be so much fun if I could just put one double together just to say I did it. But I already know what would happen. I think happen. you could. No, nope, don't tip me, dude. I'm gonna freaking. I, I have a broken could. femur. I have a broken <laughs> femur. It's not worth it. It's, I mean, I, I think my limit on that place is probably gonna be on a 110. Yeah. I haven't been out there in a minute. And I need to go out there and check out the super. Oh yeah, the boys did good, man. Yeah. The boys did. It good. looks like art. Yeah, no, they always do. Man. Oh, it's gorgeous. 402 kills it. They do. They did. A, they did a great job, and it's exciting to see. And it, and we're excited too with Wilfredo to you know have him on board and help him out. I mean, it's it's just fun for me, you know, to kind of put this. I, I don't want to call it putting the band back together, but it's it's <laughs> kind of like taking one of our, 
you know, Dade City locals that's, you know, the, one of the Dade City heroes, yeah. one of the OGs, you know, and, and put him back on the track, and we're going to try and race Minios, and then he's going to make a run at Loretta's in plus 30. Yeah, I'm going to try. Uh, plus 30 is, I think, no guys that have ever scored a pro point can race it. Yeah. I think I have a good shot. Yeah, so we're going to try and – Minios obviously is uh, November, the week of Thanksgiving, so we'll go through that, and then, you know, if we wanted – race yeah it's kind of up to him but you know if he wants to race daytona supercross we'll have the semi there too and then uh, loretta's will be august late late july early august of next year so we're planning on on so you're committed to this right now yeah you're good all right all right i want to do it it's fun and yeah it'll be cool to follow the journey you know follow along i mean you know again you talk about the peaks and the highs of 65s 85s you know going to the red is in 450b 450a taking five years off the bike and and not even riding at all and then starting to get back in i mean old boy's been over here at the at the facility on the rower you know on the rowing machine Mm -hmm. he's got troll training set up now he's committing man he's he was over there the other day doing yoga i'm like what the heck is this guy doing over here hey whatever troll training is thrown at me i'm doing it because i know the martin brothers yeah they never get tired yeah. Them yeah. outdoors, 30 plus two, them guys are wide open to the last lap. Yeah, and I, I know, uh, w- you know, we've got a, a little test on that Supercross track coming up this week. Old Mr. Justin Starling is going to come up and, and give us his opinions on it just before it's completely, you know, finalized. Yeah. We want to try and see how the rhythms flow and how the track layout and everything goes, which, you know, I mean, obviously 402 does a great job. They know what they're doing, but right. we, we just want to have somebody come ride it. So uh, Justin's also doing the troll training yeah so, i seen that he posted on facebook i think the other day was like his first first day on troll training yeah so good good to see him and he's going to come up and check it out so yeah we're coming along man just trying to get trying to get all that stuff mapped out and you know we still got to figure out our team uh deal right now of what we're going to do you know kind of in in our world or in in the i guess motocross industry you know, contracts and stuff kind of change around October, really by the November 1st is when everything's yeah. done. Uh, and we're talking to a ton of sponsors. I mean, you know, every day I'm, I'm phone calls. Uh, congratulations to Mr. Austin Hoover over at Fox. Just had his baby last week oh, on, nice. the, on the 12th. So congrats to Austin Hoover and his whole, you know, the entire Hoover family and Fox Nation. So uh, hopefully he can enjoy some time with that that newborn baby and you know, we're working through things with them and, and Oakley and what we're going to do as far as next year. Um, even had a great conversation the other day with, with Matt Bell and HBI and, you know, just trying to map it all out. I mean, there's there's so many moving parts in this right now that, that change daily, you know, when you're trying to think about what sponsors want and where they want you to be and what they're willing to commit to. So just trying to, trying to map all that out. But... Uh, the final thing that I wanted to talk about, Shane. Oh. The SMX playoffs. Okay. I personally, because I don't stay up super late, I typically go to bed early and I wake up really early for work. I don't stay up late. So I personally have not watched the entire thing right now. Um, but, you know, I did. I know all the highlights of everything. And we've, we've done the, sh- the Charlotte round and then, you know, the Chicago round just passed. Huge congratulations to Mr. Carson Wood for for winning the super mini class up there kid absolutely crushed it i mean absolutely crushed it so huge congratulations to carson but i want to get your opinion about this whole let me buy thing with jet and kitty i don't know the truth behind it i don't either i mean honestly what is, but it was um you know i was watching the race this morning and and uh, I don't know. I don't know if the kid like was looking down at his bike and pretending there was something wrong with it, and then waved him by. And then, but then, I didn't watch the podium speech. But then you told me that he was like, oh, I was like a gift to Kenny for having a brand new baby." And I, I, was like, I saw a clip somewhere, and I did. I did not watch the whole thing. I, I want to be very clear about that. I have yeah. not watched the whole thing right now. I just got clips and highlights and things that people, you know, Snapchatted and screenshotted to me. I woke up this morning and my text was going insane because of how great Carson did. But this whole highlight thing that I saw about Jet making some type of comment along the lines of, like, that was a gift for him having a baby or that was a baby gift or whatever, your newborn baby gift or something. I'm like, what is that about? Yeah, not to toot his horn anymore on uh, Mr. Jet, but he said that he was doing the math in his head as far as points. And if he would have let Ken Roxon buy, which he did, it'd be a bigger points gap 
between Sexton and him going to the third round. Okay. And then he also said just because he had his newborn baby, yeah, he would give them the win. Yeah. I don't know. I just I don't I I'm I was but I'm surprised. pretty sure Kenny doesn't want to win a moto like that. No, he doesn't. He wants Nobody, a, he wants to win it he like wants to win straight, it straight up. up. I mean, yeah. you're right, but I don't think when he goes to cash in that check. No, nah, he's not going to complain. But Yeah, now I can see it, though, like Wilfredo, what you talked about. If it puts a bigger gap between him and Chase going into the third and final round, I could understand the logistics of that. And I don't, I don't know how those points work because I well, thought is that the because points of, were is, only – Is that because of the double points or – I don't understand so, where his math I, was I at. I thought the points were only paid out on the overall. So it, the overall wouldn't have changed no matter the position of those two. So if the overall didn't change, then how would it change a bigger gap for Chase? That doesn't. Oh make- well, wait a minute. What was the podium? Sorry, I turned it off because I saw who won. Whatever. Yeah, it was Jet, Jet, Kenny, and Chase. But the thing so is, so if the- Jet would have won, would would have would Chase have gotten second overall? I don't know. I don't is that how it works out? I believe so. With I don't the, know. With the math. I don't know. I, I'm I'm just that has to be the reason. I kind of feel like it was one of those uh, Savachi. Tomac moments from Monster Cup years ago that we talked about on one of the episodes that Savachi yeah. was in here with us on, and he was talking about the whole let Tomac buy, <laughs> you know, when they were he thought he was outside of the stadium where nobody could see, and you know, okay, go ahead and let him buy. So I, I don't know. That. I just I saw one of those highlights, and I I I was just surprised. That, that, that's got to be it because obviously if Kenny got second, you know, then. Maybe. Chase probably yeah. would have been second overall because of Kenny's first finish. Well, the first moto was Jet. Yes. And then Sexton. Yes. And was it Roxon? Yes. That makes sense. So then the second moto. Kenny wins. Went, Kenny wins. Yeah, yep. so he goes 3-1. Gets second. Jet goes 1-2. And then, and then Chase two, goes 2-3. Two, three. Three. So that right. puts Sexton in third. Yeah. So, overall. So, yeah. So, I, the, so the math is there. And it was double points, so obviously – there's more points at hand. Yeah. Hey, whatever. I mean, uh, like I've, I've said, I knew there was nothing episode. wrong with this bike because yep. he never, after he let Kenny buy, he never really dropped time. Yep. Yeah. You know, so I was like, I, I love Jet and Hunter what and, a, and the Lawrence family. So, I mean, I'm not knocking him whatsoever. I was just like, what, what is a, this about? What a, what a smooth operator, though. Man, and he's doing that all while he's racing. Yeah. yeah. While things are coming at him so fast. Yeah. That's, no, that's impressive. That's, that's funny. Impressive. It'll be interesting sure to see. Chase though. wasn't very happy about that. No, I'm sure he wasn't. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the final round because the the points are pretty close there for them going into the final round. So that's, Hunter showed up this weekend too. Yeah, he but did Shimoda, great man, that guy's on fire right now. Yeah, he is. Unbelievable. Yeah, no, Love he's doing it. great. And like I said, you know, it was really really cool to see in the super mini class. There's a lot of big names in that class. You know, I mean, the the different guys there. You know, Vincent Way was in it. Seth Dennis was in it, and then Carson taking the win just absolutely crushed him man he he did a phenomenal job so again you know i know we already said it but huge huge congrats uh to carson and the entire wood family team green kawasaki hbi racing and you know we help him out too uh the last i don't know four or five years between brian and, and myself um you know doing whatever we can so it, it was cool to see and see his progression so that you know good good for him and congrats to all all of the the wood family for that but outside of that well, Fredo, it's time to get in shape, man. Yeah, I'm trying. It's going to be hard. You know, it's been five years that I've been off the bike. It's been five years since I've worked out. Yeah. You know, I only work out because of racing. Right. You know, I don't, I don't enjoy working out. I, I agree. But if it's going to help me in riding a motorcycle, I'm going to do it. Yeah. What, do you ever look at your heart monitor on your iPhone? I'd, Being well, a UPS I, I driver, have, like, what do, you, what do you have going on? Like, what are your average steps per day? So I do about, uh, it's probably like eight to 10 miles a day. I don't know what the step count is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it adds up to about eight to 10 miles. miles. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine. Yeah. It's a lot. Tyler, Wait. when was the last time you worked out? 1996. <laughs> <laughs> is that when you were born? Or? Good answer. Yeah, day after I was born. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I agree with you, though, about the whole – I'm not a huge fan of working out either. I'm, yeah. I, I mean, I do some cardio and stuff when I have to for the yeah. doctor and, and stuff like that. But like you said, if it's, if it's for riding and it's going to benefit you, then then absolutely let's get after it and go. But looking forward to following the progression and see how it goes. I know we've talked about some fun ideas, of, you know, social media, YouTube, whatever, trying to watch your journey through this. And we'll continue to talk about it on the podcast too. But outside of that, you know, Wilfredo, anybody that you want to thank for – 
you know, your time over here or people that have helped you or made an impact to you in your life? Man, since I've been here in America and, and I've met so many people through racing, uh, there's a bunch of families like the Keelons, the Yohos, yeah. you know, Sam and Karen Hart. Sam used to do the track at Dade City. Oh, yeah. yeah. They took me in for a little bit. The Langs, just those people helped me out tremendously through life, not even through racing. It was just life in general. No, I know you and I mentioned the other day that like even the Brown family, you know, Keith and Seth, yeah. I mean, the whole Brown downtown Seth Brown. I mean, they're great people again. And, you know, the, you get into this little community and it's so easy to find great people. I mean, there's, there is a lot of fun people. That's probably the most enjoyable thing for me about going to the track. Even when I do FTRs, you know, Shane and I do a lot of FTRs together and we, we get to travel to those. And when you set up your motor home right next to, you know, like Shelby and Corey Keelon, right? Yep. So I go awning to awning with them and, you know, our kids are playing together and we're sitting around a fire telling lies, you know, about how great we thought we used to be, whatever it may be. That's the, the stuff that I love the most. And even that week of Minios, the racing is great, but the nightlife, the being able to, to sit around with your friends at a campfire or at a motor home, or even if we, last year we hosted a couple dinners and had a, a DJ come and play or a, ba a band came, came and play, that, that's the stuff that I really enjoy. The camaraderie, the, the friendliness, the family. I mean, I think in the end, we're all here to try and enjoy this sport and have fun with each other. You know, obviously I don't want to, I don't like seeing people put other people down or I know there's drama involved in it. I, I personally try to stay pretty clear of the drama. Yep. Uh, I'm not, that doesn't excite me much, but I do enjoy, you know, the camaraderie at the races. I know the feeling that Wilfredo feels, you know, I'm not from here and he took me in, you know, and we've, we've been side by side for a while now. Yeah. I mean, Puerto Rico, California, damn near the same, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely a different country, <laughs> but you know, like you said, and the, all the people I've been introduced to through this guy over here, it's, you know, this community is cool, man. Like, yeah. Everybody's just super chill and yeah, we always have a good time. Yeah. Out there on the track. You know, it's just you and your motorcycle, and you're by yourself. There's no team. Yeah. But as soon as you get off of it, just the families that come together. Yeah. And the people that you meet, I wouldn't change it. Yeah, for sure. You know? Yeah. That's one of the things I, I enjoy the most about it. You know, I know, Shane, you did it a lot longer than I did when we going across the country and everything. But you get to travel to some really cool places, and you get to meet some really cool people. You know, there's, there's people, and even when we're done with this podcast that I'm going to do dinner with tonight, that I would not have met if it wasn't for motocross, right. you know, and we, the three of us are sitting in this room because of motocross. That's the one common denominator that brought all of us together. And there's some really great people out there, you know, and I, I appreciate everybody listening and I appreciate yeah. every, all the people that we've met and got to, got to include in this journey. And, and I appreciate the support. You know, I, I hope that we can continue to, to try and help people. And if people, you know, take a step back. I mean, at the end of the day, we're just a couple guys and a couple people trying to help other people. And I think that kind of sums up most of our, sto our, our story and the community. So. It's a very good speech. I like it. Yeah. Did you like that? Yeah, like Maybe it. I should you record that. Maybe no, but, it, but, it, but it, is, it is. No, you should. Uh, it is cool, though. Like, like you said, the, the people I met, like in the pro ranks, because I spent most of my years with those people outside of my family. I still communicate with them and it's, you know, we're still tight knit and I think it'll be that way the rest of my life. Just like the people he meets with what we're doing now, like he's probably going to be friends with all these people the rest of his life, you know? So it's, it's a, it's a cool sport, you know? Yeah. It, uh, you definitely develop relationships, you know? Yeah. Well, we're going to follow along Wilfredo and, and see how this journey goes of getting back on the bike and going to do some of these races. Obviously we're, we love to support you and, and enjoy this journey. We'll, we'll watch the journey. Keep it on two wheels. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. A, that's a big that. thing, uh, big thing there. TC, anything you want to add? Final? No. Good. Mm -mm. Thanks for the input. Nope. We need to get well, TC in the gym. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's episode thirty-one. We appreciate everybody for listening. Make sure you look at us on Apple Apple Podcasts, Spotify, website, YouTube channels, wherever you can find us. Make sure to like and subscribe. We greatly appreciate it. Look up Wilfredo Guzman on the social media channels. Make sure you give him a like and subscribe, but. Please share it. Let people know about it. We greatly appreciate you. Thank you.